welcome to the September PT meeting. We have apologies from um, a fair list of people today. So, Tricia Wright from Nottinghamshire, Dr. J from the DFT, Graham Brown from West Yorkshire, Peter Stoner from Ito, David Batchelor from Ticketer, uh, Ian Barrett from Lancashire, and Mark Jones from Transport for Wales. So I think that's probably a record for the number of people that have actually apologised in advance. So we're doing well. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost bigger than the attendance list. <laughs> Not quite, but I get your point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so um, a quick, given we are a select gathering and i think there's probably a couple of people that don't know everybody let's uh, do some introductions so we'll start on the order that they appearing on my list so amy hello yeah hello hi uh, yeah i'm amy brown open data platform manager at travel line hi uh, adrian Hello, hi, uh, it's Adrian, Head of Engineering at Ember. Okay, Dan. Hi everyone, uh, Dan Saunders, Head of Products here at Basemap. Uh, Josh. Josh Goodwin from dustdive.org. Uh, Justin. We're not hearing you, you've come off mute, but we're not hearing you. Okay, anyway, that's Justin Bloom <laughs> from VIX. Um, Keith? Uh, Keith Willis from React Accessibility. Uh, Mike Baxter. Hi, Mike Baxter from Leicester City Council, uh, Transport Development Officer with uh, particular um, responsibility for uh, overseeing and managing our R RTI system in Leicester and Leicestershire. Cheers. Okay. Mike Nolan. Yeah, afternoon, everybody. Mike Nolan, Customer Experience Manager at Traveline. Thank you. Uh, ben. Hello, Ben Murray. I'm the Product Manager for BODS. I work for KPMG delivering BODS for the DFT. Uh, Nick. Uh, Nick Truscott. Uh, primary role is um, network planning within Cornwall Council, but also an interest on the information systems. And I'm interested to have a bit of a pick up later around the DFT disruptions, if we can. How that fits uh, into Yes, things. we should be able to. Yeah. 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 Um, so Nick. Who's on putting a pound in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're still no, stuck you're still, you, Nick. That's another pound. <laughs> <laughs> you can't come off mute. Why can't you come off mute? I don't know. You're on mute. How weird. We'll come back while he sorts yeah. that out, eh? <laughs> uh, Rob. Hello, Rob West from Illidium. Um, focusing very much these days on data quality, timetables and real-time data. Um, and doing a bit of fair stuff as well in NetEx. OK, uh, Nick, you've come off mute now. I have come off mute, yes. <laughs> I, I forgot I was in Teams. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's such a circuitous route in when you when you haven't got a link. Anyway, here I am. Yes, Nick Carey, I work with Teresa. I think that's all we need. <laughs> Is that it? All right, OK. Yeah, and Teresa. I work with Nick. I uh, know I'm taking the notes for this. Sorry, we're in the giggle zone. Leave you to it, Tim. I'll shut up. Uh, Thomas. Uh, you're 
off mute, but we can't hear you. Seems oh. he's on mute. Eh? Oh, he's having trouble as well. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh there he is. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, double mute. Uh, hi there, Thomas Ferry, uh, part of the technology team at Stagecoach, uh, also using bods and associated uh, transport feeds in a personal capacity. Yeah, and uh, I ought to introduce myself, uh, Tim Rivet from Arctic. So uh, that is uh, everybody. Hopefully you had a copy of the last meeting minutes. Um, for a change, I don't think there's any um, actions. Any Either that or my printer's to... run out of red ink. <laughs> no, I think there was there was one or two things which I think you were going to go and chat with someone following up. Most of it was invites of people to feedback to you or something like that, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah, which I had quite a lot of stuff come back. So, uh, yeah, cool. thank you. Uh, is there anything from the minutes of the last meeting that anybody wants to raise? No. OK. Um, in which case, uh, we will move on to the rest of the agenda um, and to bus open data uh, service. And we've got Ben giving us the update because Triumph's on leave today. Oh, yeah, Triumph's another apology. Mm. Sure thing. Shall I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please. Right, I'm going to try and share it directly in the application if that if that works. It does seem to most of the time these days. It's loading. OK. Yeah. How does that look? Does that look all right? That looks good, yeah. OK, great. So I'm going to talk about what we're up to on BODS focusing on AVL and timetables. I'll touch on disruptions, but really that's Stephen Penn's area. Um, I'm going to leave fares for, uh, mostly for Stephen as well, but I'll, I'll touch on that and talk about that if needed. Um, but yeah, this, this deck is all about AVL and timetables. Can you see the slide move? I can on my screen. Does that, has that gone to the content slide? Yeah, yeah, it has. OK, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the metrics that we're measuring um, and also the development work that we're that we're doing and also give a heads up on what we're likely to be doing for the rest of the year. But I will caveat that saying we kind of change our minds sometimes and work on something different. But um, this is what we're, we're likely to do. Uh, please interrupt me with any questions. You don't need to wait to the end. I'm happy for you to interrupt and ask any questions as I'm talking through. OK. Right, so um, we're not complete yet on BODS. We're measuring a few things on BODS. We're, me we're measuring how, how complete we are, um, how up to date the data is. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the way that we're me measuring that. Um, so there's 8,000 and something service codes published. So this is a combination of registered services and unregistered services. So we're very happy on BODS to have some unregistered services. We think this is useful for those that are using the data, not to exclusively look at those that are registered with the OTC. Um, and so um, all of these are, um, this count is all of those service codes that are, that are published to bots. Um, so we can see 6,683 service codes published to bots map and match up with the with the service codes that are registered with the OTC. And what I'm going to talk about shortly is how we're beginning to lift the lid on the lines that we can see that are associated with those registrations, with those service codes. So we've got a, a feature which enables us to, um, in a machine, kind of, what's the right word? In a machine readable way, interpret the OTC data when it comes to the 
the lines that are associated with each of the of the registrations and we've just put that and it's visible in the in the type separate data catalog so there's a fair there's a variety of different separators that are used sometimes it's a comma separator sometimes it's a pipe sometimes it's a um it's a space um and so there's a few different rules that we've used to interpret these separators and when they should be used and when they shouldn't be used um, so for example when it shouldn't be used is a space separator for the for the line that's called um, park and ride. We don't want to count that as three different lines. Um, we don't end up with a park and, and, and a ride as three different lines that are associated with that registration. So, um, but sometimes you do get um, space genuinely space separated values. But there are some rules that we can we can use to read the data from the OTC API to understand that. So, um, when doing that, we've we've measured that for these six thousand six hundred eighty three service codes that are that are published to BODs. There are 9,459 lines um, associated with those with those service codes with those registrations. And then um, of these service codes that are published that match up with the with the service codes on, on the OTC database, uh, just over a thousand of them require attention. So this is where we're measuring how how live the data is. So there's a few different ways that we measure this. First, we we ask whether the data is really old, hasn't been updated in over 12 months. Um, it normally means that it should have been if it hasn't been updated in 12 months. Um, secondly, we'll look at whether there's been any changes on the OTC database. If they have, then that normally means that bots should be updated too. So if you're changing the frequency or the route or something like, something like that on the on your registration, you probably need to update bots too. Um, and lastly, if there is any validity period end dates, operating period end dates in the data, and if those are in the past, then we consider your data as requiring attention as well. Um, so there's a few different ways that we measure, not only have you published what you, as an operator, should have published to bots, but also, is it up to date? Have you updated it recently? And if you've updated OTC, have you updated BODS too? Um, so, so the vast majority of these services that are published and do match up with the OTC are up to date, um, uh, as far as we can tell. We're not checking accuracy here. So what we're not doing is reconciling the data in the trans exchange file to what's advertised on the website or in the details of the of the of the registration. Um, so at the moment, we're trying to find ways to visualize that information for an operator to help them check your accuracy themselves or to check third parties, enable third parties to check that accuracy too. Um, so for now, we're focusing on completeness um, and whether and and timeliness, whether that data is up to date um, and we're enabling accuracy to be checked separately. Hey, Dan, I can see your hand just popped up. Hi, yeah. Um, just, quick question, just to be clear on this, so we're saying there's 8,071 service codes published in total within BODS, uh, and you said you've got 6,683 registered with the OTC. Yep. What's, the, what's the amount missing that isn't in BODS? Well, I was tempted to put that information here, and I think that it's, it's less straightforward. We, we, we need a new feature to help us to answer that in an automated way. Um, so I can give you some high level numbers. Um, and there's there's a few different moving parts to it, so I'll talk about that a little bit. So you've got all of the you've got all of the um, um, registrations on on the OTC database, but several of these are out of scope of bots for two main categories of reason. First is they might not be England um, English op uh, English services. Um, so uh, if they are purely in London or or if they are, but they wouldn't be registered on BODS. If they if they are purely in, sorry, on the OTC. If they're purely in Wales or purely in Scotland, then they're out of scope. Uh, if they are cross border, then they'll be in scope. Um, but there isn't an indicator that we've implemented yet onto BODS that measures whether they are a cross border service and whether that service is purely in in Wales and or purely in Scotland. Um, we we um, we're looking to to get that information by using the um the data about the local authorities that are associated with the with the with the registration and if it's registered only with a with a welsh local authority then we're likely to mark that as as not in scope of bods and if it's only registered with a scottish local authority then we'll mark that as out of scope but if it's registered as a combination of both wales and 
England or a combination of both Scotland and, and England in terms of the local authorities it's, it's registered to, then we're likely to consider those in scope as a cross-border service. Um, and, and the same with, um, uh, with London. If it's registered um, with TfL and another um, local authority will consider that as a cross a cross border service. So what we're going to do is bring that information in, which we don't currently. And so that that is done manually at the moment, and I haven't got those stats here, but I can give you a high level stat. But before I do, I'll mention the other second category of service, which is not in scope of BODS, which is registered with the OTC, and that is those that are being assessed and determined as out of scope by the um, the DVLA. Um, DVSA, I should say, DVSA. So we've got um, we've got some conversations that are going on between the DVSA and the OTC, um, a set and talking to the local authorities to determine whether um, these services are out of scope. And some of them, some of these are being marked as such. There is a conversation that's going on around exactly how that determination is being made. But in some cases, that determination has been made, and we've got that information on BOLS as well. Um, so considering these two ways of marking data as out of scope, um, we we have um, a count of 90% um, of, the, of the services that are registered with the OTC uh, are published on BODS. I don't have the count of how many of these of this 90% require attention, but that's about, about where we're looking at. Um, but I can come back to you, Dan, with the count of how many services the BCM team are tracking these more, more accurately um, it, it, in the BODS team. Um, but, uh, but I can come back to you, Dan, with those exact numbers of how many service codes are registered with the OTC and are in scope. Um, either because we're in English or a cross border service, or they're, or they're not as a scope because they're not a closed school service. Um, but yeah, I don't have the count, I'm afraid. But okay. ninety percent is the is the is the is where we are with timetables. There's a separate count for fares and a separate count for AVL, and all those counts are available too. Um, so uh, I can bring those numbers to the next meeting. Um, but these are the yeah, you know, these are the high level counts that I've brought with me today. Hi, right, brilliant. Thank you very much. I think Ben, it might be useful if you were to able to let me and Teresa have those, you know, uh, next week sometime if you can, so we can circulate them because next oh, that's time good we idea. meet will be Christmas, which is yeah. quite a long time away. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. These numbers are ready, um, and so yeah, we can get those to you. And so if you can distribute them, yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Rob, I think you've got your hand up next. Uh, yeah, just um, picking up on that um, discussion about whether services are cross-border and looking at the circulated local authorities. Um, historically, I found that to be very unreliable um, and potentially you're introducing a loophole there because if somebody publishes a trans exchange without the right local authority in it, you, it can be deemed as being out of scope when actually it should have been in scope. Um, what I found is that just looking at the um, the NAPTAN codes gives you a very clear indication um, of whether the service is travelling into a different local authority and therefore a different part of the UK. Um, and it's not that complicated to to implement, um, and it's more difficult to uh, to to uh, find a loophole with that mechanism as well. Hi, Rob. Yeah, it's um, it's something with. It's a bit back to front though. So the problem is we we need to know before the data is published whether it's in scope or not. And so you can only detect from the stops once it's been published. And so what we are, yeah, well, I'd be interested in seeing, seeing what your thoughts are on that. But uh, what, we, what we're aiming to do is bring up a list of what does complete look like. And that list is based on what's on the OTC database. And you're right, there is, there are some data quality problems that I'm working with um, the different um, stakeholders in, involved in that, and often that's working with the with those that are maintaining the registration. So I'm I'm working with local authorities to help them make sure make sure that if a registration needs to be updated, then great. So what we what we're doing is presenting lists to local authorities, saying these are the services that we can see that are associated with with you, um, and and how complete the data is according to that list and this enables local authorities to check whether that list is complete and, and compares accurately to their records um, 
but you're absolutely right. I think there is total um, capacity for there to be loopholes where the registration is not updated correctly, doesn't have the English local authority on that registration, even though it does cross the border. Um, but yeah, the details of the stops that are used, if that data was published to BODS, we could totally take the the stops and see and see what areas they're in. But if it's if it's not published to BODS, then we, we don't see that information. Does that make sense, Rob? Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, certainly the way I implemented it was to cross reference with a different source. So in other words, TNDS, for example. Um, but I appreciate that that's not appropriate always and may not be something that you can do as a sort of checking mechanism. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, checking with other sources to see what other data is out there and what is available and consider if it's available elsewhere, then then assessing whether it should be on BODS is, is another way of doing it. And it's, it's something we've looked at. Uh, it's not currently something that we're going to be looking at in in the short term but it is something that has been on my radar as a, as one way of measuring what complete looks like um the registrations is seen as the as the source of the truth um but i think that what we as, as you say that there are issues with the quality of that um and 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 therefore it's helpful to feed back to the otc where we think that 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 source of what the truth is needs to be updated and if we can assess all the data sets that are available uh, and and review whether that needs feeding back to the to those that are maintaining that maintaining that registration so we can get it updated i think that's that's a way that we can we can close that loop so yeah that that makes sense so i'm not i'm not closing the door on looking at the tnds data or any other data that's available out there and seeing whether it does step into england and therefore review whether it might be in scope or not i think that makes sense yeah thank you okay um, so we have a similar but different set of challenges for AVL, measuring completeness there. Um, Before we move on, yeah. Nick's got his, Nick's been oh, hey, Nick. waiting in the yeah. wings Hi. for a while. Yeah, yeah, Hi please there, go yes. um, you've, you've checked to see whether service codes have registered with the OTC. Uh, does that include authorities that have assumed traffic commissioner uh, responsibilities? Well, yeah, very good question. We're in progress with that. Um, so we're working with TFWM, TFGM and Wecker and Hertfordshire um, to try and get the registrations that are that are managed there into BODS. And that's not been achieved yet. And we're looking at, at ways to, to do that. Um, so, yeah, the, the data here is only comparing with the OTC. Um, so we do have a gap that needs to be plugged. Um, the way that we're that, hoping... That, that sounds like quite a large gap. It is. It is indeed. Yeah, it's about... The biggest one is TFWM with about a 1,000 a thousand registrations there. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at um, closing this with an interim solution and then a, and then a long-term solution. Um, the interim solution is is likely to be, we, we were hoping we wouldn't have to uh, use it uh, because it would be a throwaway solution, but um, but it turns out the long-term solution is gonna be, is, and that is connecting to an API, is not gonna be as quick as we had hoped. So it, earlier on in the year, we're thinking we'll have all of these different APIs for these different um, um, enhanced partnerships set up and connected to BODS by around the summer. Um, it hasn't transpired that way. They're not quite ready yet. So we're, look, we're going to be looking at an interim solution to manually import the data, get an extract from these different um, entities each month perhaps, and, uh, uh, and, and, and get this imported into BODS so that we can then measure the completeness of these until we do have a, an API that BODS can talk to and get those updated on a, on a nightly overnight process. Um, so yeah, it is, a, it is a hole that we're looking to fill and we haven't filled it yet. Um, so, but in, in the meantime, yeah. out of your 403 active feeds, AVL feeds, uh, will this affect your, your AVL assessment or is it purely to do with timetables? In well, actually, in the terms that we're using here, it is purely in terms of timetables. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the, what the match, matching scores mean in a minute. But um, but yeah, when it comes okay. to that, w w when we're measuring what complete looks like for timetables, we need to add the information from the enhanced partnerships to that list so that we've got a um, a, a full complete list of of service codes that we'd like to see on BODS. 
uh, and then compare that to what we can actually see on bots and then how many of these are actually up to date and, and live. Um, okay. So yeah, getting get that list of what complete looks like is what we're working on. Um, but yeah, coming to AVL, so we've got 403 feeds. So this means that um, um, different operators across BODS, some of them have published more than one because they're very large organizations, but only, there's only a handful of these. So for, for the large part, this means that we've got about 400 operators that are publishing AVL data for their fleet. Um, and we've had 50 new feeds this year. Um, there's still a, still a way to go. Um, we, we think we're around three quarters complete with, with the AVL data. So we, we, we still think that there's, there's a bunch, an additional um, around 100 operators to, to publish their data. Um, so then I go on to talk about the, uh, the matching score. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to talk about how we're measuring completeness and how we're hoping to do that going forward. So at the moment, when it comes to our timetables, um, when we're looking at who's published timetables, we look at um, what licenses they're associated with. And then if, if we can see that there's a license that doesn't have any organization associated with it, then we'll get that set up and get those invited. So um, we, as I say, we, we, we can see that there's around 100 operators that haven't published an AVR feed yet. Um, and um, but what we're not doing is measuring the contents of those to say, are you publishing data for all of your journeys? And so it's something that we're hoping to be able to do. Uh, it's not something we can do in a productionized capacity, but we're hoping to do this in a, in a more um, manual way. We're hoping to look at the the journeys and the and the lines and the and the services that are, that are that are present and, and published, uh, and then look and review the AVL data that's been published to see can we see at least some of your location data for each of the lines and each of the services. So we're not doing that yet. Purely what we, all we're doing currently is a bit is a bit blunt. It's just saying, have you published your AVL feed yet? On the assumption that if you have, then it's connected to all of your fleet and all of your buses have got AVL machines installed on them. Uh, that's not always necessarily the case, but we're, we're hoping to do and check this in a, in a manual way um, and then communicate with operators if there's some kind of issue with that feed we're not getting the not getting the data coming through or if we think that we're only getting data for some of the services and not all of them um, so it's a manually intensive process but we're, we're going to be starting to do that um, soon um, so for now we're just looking at active feeds um, and then one, one thing we are um, doing in an active way is looking at how well that data matches and this is often a good reflection of how complete the data is so we'll sample check the the messages, the AVL messages that we're receiving, and we ask, can we see a timetable for that? Um, can we see that you've published your your timetable and does it have the correct data in it? So something you were talking about earlier, Mike, although we don't use revenue codes in our matching algorithm, we use the just the basic information. We use national operator codes, um, the line names and the journey codes to see whether we can see this data represented so that um, what we're expecting to see for each vehicle message that we receive that we can see the actual journey present in the timetable data and we can see that there's only one of them and there's no complicated issues that mean that there's two of them and a consumer therefore would have difficulty knowing which one is is the actual journey that that bus driver is uh, is sending data for um so uh, a good number of these are matching 75 percent or above so that means that we've got a reasonable amount of quality for the uh, for a good chunk of these feeds and 24 of them are perfect in the in the checks that we're making. So um, there is a, a, a reasonable amount of these operators where every AVL message that we're receiving, we can see just by using these things, the national operator code and the line name, exactly what journey that bus is on and where it's going and what the origin is, what the des destination is. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so that it, it means that consumers have a really good uh, experience with that data and can easily uh, understand where that data is, where that bus is going. Okay, so that's where where progress is, but I'll I'll come back to you, Tim, with the with the numbers as we talked about earlier. Right, so please interrupt us with any other questions. We're just going to go to the next next slide. So, um, what have we been working on? So I'm just going to talk about the last couple of releases. We've been updating these matching reports to make them a little bit simpler, reorganizing the, the structure of them. They're mostly read by suppliers, technology suppliers like Ticketer and Omni and, and Trapeze and the like. But so we try, but nonetheless, we're trying to simplify these a little bit because they are quite complicated. Um, and also we've been making it more achievable for operators to achieve 100%. 
So the point here is here that we don't have service codes in the AVL message. Um, and, and this means that um, sometimes we can't see whether that journey is for the line one in town A or the line one in, in town B, um, if, the if the national operator code is the same. Um, the service code would be required to help us understand which which of those towns, you know, which line one is it actually on? Um, but it's not the operator's fault. They can't supply this. There's no capacity for, to enable them to supply this data. So it's not fair to mark them down, um, although it doesn't make the life of the consumer any easier. But nonetheless, what we want to do is try to enable an operator to achieve 100% with their matching score as far as they're able to do so. So we, we've we've done that. Um, I'm just going to touch on disruptions integration. So what this means is that new data created is now available through Buzz. You can download it or you can access the API. Um, we've, been, we've been improving the tight open data catalog. So in particular, um, this means that if you if you can see a registration on the tight open data catalog that's not published, you can see what organization should have published that data. So if you're interested in um, in why the data isn't there, you can see who who should have published it and uh, and, and reach out to that operator. Um, and also, as I say, we've got the details of the lines that belong to each registration as well. So we've we've got some, uh, I think, really interesting data that we're going to um, I'll talk about, about briefly shortly on the next slide. But what this means is that we can see from a completeness perspective, not only all the registrations that should be on boards, but all the lines that belong to those registrations, too. Um, application monitoring, you might be aware that earlier on in the year we had about a week of really bad performance on BODS. Um, since then, we've had a few blips, um, but what we've done now, we've in really um, improved the monitoring um, and the visibility that we've got of the infrastructure that's behind BODS um, so that we can see when and why there are any availability issues um, with insights that we didn't have before, but th th this makes a big difference for the availability. Um, so we've we've now had a, a quite a long period of um, of really low latency and high performance on BODS. Um, but if we do get any blips or any downtime, then we'll be able to to deal with that a lot more effectively. And then finally, um, we've improved the way that we synchronize with, with the OTC. So this means that if we can detect a change is made to a service, um, a registration on the OTC, we are more effectively mapping that to the data that's been published to BODS. Um, so uh, it, was, it was a little bit, um, it was implemented not quite right initially earlier in the year. So we've improved the way that we do that so that now we can see any data that is associated with that OTC change is considered and not marked stale when it shouldn't be. Okay, so I think I'll come to the last slide now. Upcoming features, I'll just whiz through these really quickly. Um, personally identifiable information, something that we're working on. We could, we've noticed that there are some Windows usernames in some of the headers of trans exchange files that are being published, and sometimes these contain the name of the user that's generated that data. So we're blocking and removing these as we encounter them. Um, later in October, we'll be implementing the flexible services validation rules, and then following that, implementing visibility of flexible services. We're not expecting much to be published with with this type of data, uh, but nonetheless, the ability will be there. Um, and then in December, we, we're likely to focus on line level completeness. So what this means is using the, the detail we've got now about what lines belong to each registration, we'll begin to report on whether we can see all the data for all of those lines across all the different data types that we've got. That's it. Thank you, Ben. My pleasure. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah, I've got one. Nick, yes. Hello. Yes, I've just gone in and downloaded the Cornwall Council detailed service code export report. Oh, yeah. And I'm slightly concerned about what I'm seeing in it, to be honest. Um, how do we interpret that to, in a way in which we go to our operators and say, you need to sort this out? Well, yeah, we've tried hard to make this um, helpful and useful to you. Um, so, the idea is if I'm in your shoes, I would look at this report and then um, try to work with the operators to to achieve 100 um, um, percent. Or 
or the opposite actually, zero zero percent services recurring retention should be aiming for zero percent. So, uh, so what this means, and you should be able to use the detailed export. Have you been able to download that report? I've got it open in Excel here yeah. at the moment. Yeah, great. So what you should be able to do there is have a look at the at the services that are listed, and hopefully there'll be services that you recognise, and you should be able to see the operators. That are, that are associated with each of these service codes. And you can see whether they are published or not, uh, whether they require attention or not. So I can see for Cornwall um, that, that, yeah, there's about 60% of these require attention. And there's two, two main reasons why they might require attention. So you should be able to see the column that says whether they're published or not. And maybe I'll just share the, the screen and just talk through it a little bit. Might that be helpful if I've got time for that, Tim? Uh, yes. Well, we can take it offline and, yeah. yeah. I should prefer Nick's, but perhaps I'll have a conversation with you separately. So there's, yeah, there's, but I'll just briefly mention that in column A, it'll see whether it requires attention or not. And if it does require attention, it's because either it's um, unpublished or if it is published, then it's got some kind of liveness data, liveness problem with it. So maybe it's, it's out of date, hasn't been updated recently. So what this means is if you can see it's unpublished, then Work with, we can work with the operator to get it published, and if it is already published, then we work, we can work with the operator to get that data re refreshed and updated on bots. Interesting. Some of these appear to be split registrations, so it might okay. be they've uploaded the timetable file they've uploaded into bots is the whole route. Yeah, yeah. And the bit that's marked as stale is the split registration part. That's what it appears to be on some. But there's also an operator here that's long since ceased. Clearly, the registrations haven't been cleared out of the OTC yeah. database. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So with split registrations, we can update it to consider them to mark those. And we're likely to use the scope uh, method to, to indicate that. So we can mark those as as, as out of scope. As a, uh, um, And then for those registrations that need to be updated, they're no longer active. Then we can we can work with the OTC to get those get those removed if the operator isn't, hasn't gone to that gone into that trouble to 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 deregister those. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to you separately, Nick, to understand which one of these are split registrations and which ones are unregistered, so we can get those tidied up to remove the yeah to remove the noise, and that, and that should hopefully give you a helpful report uh, once that once that is done. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thank yeah. you, Ben. Um, thank you for stepping in um, at shortage notice to uh, to provide that update. Um, My pleasure. Before we move on to fares. Um, just to, to pick up on that split registration um, thing, it is a an issue uh, industry wide. Whoever handles data uh, has to be able to cope with it. Um, it's something that uh, I've been doing some uh, thinking on, and there are some options for how bots might be able to handle it. Um, with the department for consideration. Um, and so uh, there'll be some advice coming out um, in due course on that, um, hopefully to uh, to resolve some of those issues or at least make them easier to, to handle because it's, you know, they're fairly widespread and it's a, something that operators raise on a regular basis. So uh, yeah, so there's work in progress on that. OK, so um, whilst we have uh, Stephen Penn, who has joined us um, because I know he's uh, got some time constraints, let's have fares. And I don't know whether you're able to, to do anything on disruptions as well. Stephen, uh, yes, briefly. well, yeah, I actually have more to say on disruptions than I do on fares, so that's probably about right. Excellent. Unlike Ben, I've not come very well prepared, so it will have to be um, a verbal update. Um, yeah. But in terms of fares, um, there hasn't really been a major change in terms of what, you know, the BODS platform um, and fares. I think the only thing we've done is made a small change to rectify an error in the validation process that was marking various files as invalid when they weren't. Um, Ticketer have pushed out um, their updates to ensure that um, operators can export valid netex 
Um, so you should start to see now that when you search the BOSS platform for first data, more and more of it is being marked as compliant as operators obviously update and refresh their data sets. Um, there are still some tickets or operators that are being marked as non-compliant, but that's because <coughs> they have um, fare zones without stops in, um, which I'm led to believe is due to issues locally where you know things aren't in nap time that should be in nap time or there's a disagreement between the operators and local authorities about what constitutes a stop um so we don't really have a way forward for solving that yet um the validated maximum is non-compliant because really we want a fair zone to have stops in it otherwise it's useless from, from a, a journey planning and pricing perspective um vixie still yet to release their updates so state scope data will still be non-compliant um in terms of next steps um, the next thing will be an update to the validator to handle CAN FS, um, which it currently will just mark as not compliant. Um, and there will be advisory note probably next week circulated on how to handle a CAN FS or how BODS expects to see a CAN FS handled, um, which I guess is the precursor to a wider complex FS um, update. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's where we are with FS at the moment. Not much movement from a technical perspective really it's about getting the operators to actually start to utilize the updates their suppliers have made for them and start to update the data um, until we have a consistent structure across all the first data that's being published um does anybody have questions about that no uh, okay well i'll talk about the structures as well uh, ben's already touched on it um the new DFT on disruption service went live in August. Um, and last week, um, as part of the major BOD release, we launched the, the API layer on BODs. So now the service is integrated with BODs. There is a disruptions API on BODs. Um, you can basically download um, Sirius X being produced by the disruption service in the same way that you can, you know, get timetable data and AVL data now. And so that's essentially our fault data set on BODs. Um, at the moment, it's only available as an API or sort of like a direct URL download. Um, we are going to kind of flesh out the way disruptions are navigated on BODs to the point where we will have a way to browse to local authorities and see active disruptions in any local authority area. Um, I think because some operators have complained that the, you know, they don't have full visibility of disruptions in their area, they're actually impacting their services. Um, so we're going to try and fill in the gaps there. In terms of coverage, you know, we've onboarded all of the um, all of the local authorities that we're using the ITOR DMT service um, that cover the north of England. So anybody who's using Sirius X should move over to the BOSS platform now because all the data will come via that API rather than the ITOR service. Um, and we've got Nick Truscott on the call. Cornwall have, have been the first kind of non northern authority to join the disruption service. Um, we're looking at Essex and West Midlands and west of England and a few others joining in the next few months. So hopefully we can um, expand that Sirius X feed to a nationwide feed and make it a bit more appealing um, to data consumers. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we've done with the disruptions in the last couple of months. Um, does anybody have any questions about the Sirius X or disruptions coverage? Nick, you raised disruptions at the start. Can we discuss yeah. it? I was just going to say that we are using, we are transitioning our disruption information across now into the system. And we've actually got a number of disruptions live in the system. And I think Josh is on the call, isn't he? I noticed they're being picked up now on bustimes.org. So, yeah, for us, it's just another step in the, as we talk about single source of the truth in terms of information. So, you know, the basis I'm using, I'm putting in descriptions and linking to the one network description of why the closure is occurring in the first place. So the customer can see that, you know, what's what's the cause of their disruption, which is quite important to us at the moment when we've got lots of big highway schemes and gas schemes, water schemes going on, causing us headaches, shall we say. But yeah, it's um, a real positive step forward for us. Um, we're hoping to integrate it into our own council website to save double double creation of the data just got to get the api past our web team to do that um and then in turn into our app that we're developing our transport for cormal app will use this data as well so yeah massive step forward for us 
Excellent. Very good news. I think uh, Thomas has got his hand up as well. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I've just, I think uh, sort of to uh, transport to Cornwall, I'd be interested to look at this data. I'm just curious if we have a um, PTI sort of um, similar to Trans Exchange, where we've got fields, uh, sorry, um, Siri VM, where we've got fields that are a mandatory, uh, that sort of specification, or if it's just uh, compliant to Trans model generally. Um, well, we actually used the same profile that was agreed between Artig and Transport for the North. Uh, for the ITO disruption service originally, so it's identical to that. I'm sure Tim would be more than happy to point you to his website um, where the documentation is stored. Um, it's essentially exactly the same, um, with the small difference that we we um, use one of the elements now to pass the the local authorities that created the data uh, in order for people to sort of, you know, have a greater. Greater identifiability, because I think in, in the um, ITOR feed, essentially disruptions were just pumped out and there was no kind of machine readable way of working out what local authority had come from um, beyond actually actually looking at the stops and services themselves and trying to attribute them to a local authority. Um, so yeah, we've made a small improvement there, but otherwise it's identical. Um, so yeah, if Tim could post the link, that's... Yeah, I will. That's what I'm looking for now. But yeah, I mean, if anybody has any sort of questions, you know, I just encourage you to send me an email. Um, uh, happy to sort of help anybody try to use this data or understand this data or integrate it. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, just say I have dropped a, a link to a live example, of one we've got set up for tomorrow in the chat bar, which is how it's um, being presented on bustimes.org. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That's more than I managed to uh, rustle up. I was going to show, I was going to try and demo the uh, the download, but this is much better in a, in a real world scenario. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's already visible in um, South Yorkshire's website and the new B network website, the TFGM, things like that. It's already been used quite a lot. Uh, and obviously, City Mapper and Move It have uh, moved over as well. So, um, yeah, it, the data's being used, but obviously, we'd like to see it more used. Um, and obviously, like I said, the coverage, you know, sort of become nationwide. Um, Mike. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I, I've been away for a long while, so uh, excuse the stupid question about the Siri SX. So, you know, the, the, the example that's just been presented for Cornwall, um, how has that got on onto there? Is that because um, Nick from Cornwall is, is registered on BODS and has actually input that into the system or how does it how does it get how does it get there, if you see what I mean? Yeah, so that's the disruption service that I'm talking about. Um, we have, I'll just quickly show it. Um, we have a service that we've built for um, local authorities to, yeah. uh, you know, create disruptions in their area. So it's separate uh, to the to the to to bods generally. This is a another... yeah, it's 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 a supporting service of bods. It's part yeah. of the sort of wider bods ecosystem. But um, yeah, I mean, it's basically. Um, very similar to the first service that we built to help produce first data, but this is where it's coming from. So, you know, I've logged in as I've logged in, I've logged in as Cornwall from other pro site. Um, these are the disruptions that Nick has uh, upcoming. We can close that Nick's defined all of these. Um, you can go into them and have a look at them in greater detail if you want, um, you know, the consequences and the impacts. But yeah, so this is this is the service that builds the data that is now, you know, directly linked to bots. So the API um that you, you query on bods is basically just um querying stored data from this service right okay where do we find the api because i need to give those details to our web team um oh, it's in there is it okay yeah there's developer documentation but nick i'll just email you directly with some yeah brilliant advice. um yeah can, can, obviously you can use the api but there is also this direct download feature as well, if you want to do it that way. Um, she'll just download the XML file. Um, there, so there's multiple ways you can get it. Um, and like I said, this this browse data function, which doesn't have disruption data in the moment, in the end, it'll allow you to yeah to go down to local authority level and see all active disruptions in a local authority, you know, visualize on a map these kind of things. Um, but that's that's a couple of releases away, yeah, I think. Okay. Keith, 
and then we yeah. to move on. It was just about the, the link that sent through. I have got no idea about uh, Cornwall, but obviously it says the disruption. Is that all it it does? It says it, or has, ha has it updated the actual timetables which are available? If I no, it's meant to be an overlay for the timetable data, Keith, um, rather than, you know, it's, it's, it's not meant to... Uh, Obviously, time data is published by the operators, and it's a fundamental point of force that, that that data is unchanged. It's a declaration of what the operators are doing, it's their statutory obligation. So, Sirius X data is separate from that. Um, it will relate to the timetable data and tell you how it may, may be different, but it won't change it fundamentally. It won't change the data that's available on bots. No, but on the bus time or, or website, has it changed oh, well, that, that yeah. there? That's, that's what Josh to answer because obviously it's his service. Help, Josh. And will it change yeah. it, or is anyone also updating their real time based on any disruption information which is provided? I'm just seeing how far it goes down a chain somewhere. Will it help if I described how I envisage us using it in the short term in Cornwall? So the, the way we're using it in Cornwall at the moment is static data. We're not dynamically amending any data on websites. We don't have the capability to dynamically amend our real time system from this data. Um, but that's something we're specifying in our next procurement of real time will be that it has to be dynamically capable of reacting to the, the, the Sirius X feed. Yeah, I mean, a lot, you know, I think Manchester and Mersey Travel are all considering how they can use this in their real time systems, their on street displays and things. It may just be advisory notes, but of course, it does allow you to remove stops and things. Um, but I guess the big the big gap at the moment is obviously it doesn't go down to journey level, so it doesn't involve any journey level cancellations at the moment. That's something we want to look at next, um, but it's not it's not something that's going to happen in the immediate future. Does that help, Keith? Or yeah. Um, yeah, no, I was just wondering how far it got down the chain, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, not very far at this point, but it will go further. OK. Thank you, Stephen, for that update then. That's uh, there's some really good progress being made on uh, on disruptions. Um, so, uh, so that's really good. And fairs, as you say, it's uh, it's with operators to to update the data, and then uh, you know, uh, people hopefully can start to to use that the data and and see what they can do with it and how to how to present it. Okay. Um. While we're on um, Bob's stuff, um, last time we met um there was a consultation going on about flexible bus services and how to present that data ben's uh identified in the roadmap that he was um presenting uh, over the next few months there's work going on in bods to support that work the um enhancement to the Trans Exchange profile has been published on the PTI website. Um, we've done a couple of um, webinars on it and the recordings are available. So hopefully um, there's enough there for people to understand um, what it's trying to achieve. Um, there will be some sample Trans Exchange files uh, available um, fairly soon to help people. Um, you know, have something to refer to if you're creating it or consuming it. Um, the as part of the flexible services work, there was uh, an update to the Trans Exchange schema. Um, the changed files are available on the PTI website, but we've not been able to update the official Trans Exchange server. Uh, yet there's some uh, challenges in doing that that we're working through and that might take a little while yet but so in the meantime you'll need to download the schema files and validate locally if you're using the enhanced activity 
um, enumerations. Um, there is an issue on the uh, agenda later to formalise that change. Um, but if you've got any um, questions, um, queries about how to, to use the data or how to create it, then uh, please do feel free to get in touch. You should have my contact details. Um, has anybody got any questions about flexible services? No. OK. Um, last time we met, um, we uh, there had the day before been um, uh, an what's called an ignition event, looking at um, the um, some of the issues with bods and looking to the future and what might be the next steps on that. Um, the um, write up for that event uh, has been circulated with the papers. Um, so I don't know. Uh, there's a number of us that were on that are on this call that were at that event. I don't know whether anybody's got any questions on it. Takes a bit of going through. There's quite a lot in there, um, but it was a very positive day. No. OK. Um, in which case, if we move on to um, Mike, who's going to give us an update on travel line i know it's not on the agenda um <laughs> it normally is but I, I i was tardy at getting things out and asking people so uh i didn't want us to presume <laughs> no thanks tim yeah yeah spotted, uh, spotted our absence on there i thought being kicked off so no, just a brief update from travel line what we've been up to over the last kind of couple of months um currently working with our uh suppliers um based map on uh re-hosting uh, tnds on a, a more modern uh piece of infrastructure and that is fully supported so that's uh gonna happen on monday uh next week um shouldn't disrupt any kind of downloads uploads anything um for the data community so that that'll kind of complete next week uh we're also working with uh rob at lydium uh on a data quality uh project so we're looking at the data that's coming out of bods uh and how we're interpreting it at our end and then representing it uh through tnda so we we just kicked off that piece of work with rob so that'll go on between now and into the new year um so we'll give us a, a kind of clearer idea of, of let's say how complete the data is that you know if we were to take certain data sets from BODs and the quality uh, that would kind of come through the other end. Uh, we just extended our contract with Silverrail, who are our journey planning engine provider. Uh, so we've signed a, a new five year agreement with them. And as part of that arrangement, we are um, we should be in a position to uh, put to flag plus bus fares on appropriate journeys. So when journeys are coming from different zones and having bus attached to them, we should be able to start surfacing plus bus fares, uh, we're hopeful, uh, early in the new year. So that'll be a, kind of quite a good step forward for us. Uh, on the plus bus side of things, uh, we're still working on e-ticketing uh, with Ticketer. We're completing the development to be able to validate e-tickets. Uh, we've been working with the retailers. So we've got Trainline, Rail Easy and Silver Rail. <coughs> who are all in a position now uh, to start retailing. So once we kind of go live, we should be able to go pretty quick on that. As I said, we're just waiting on that final bit of, of scanning uh, development from tickets. So we're hopeful that'll, they're working on it as we speak. So we're hopeful that will, will emerge this side of Christmas and we'll be able to get that rolled out with a bit of a big bang. Uh, we're working on an interim uh, solution for the Plus Plus website um, ahead of a, a kind of more a big, bigger development in the new year, uh, just really to freshen up the look and feel of it and sharpen it up, to, ready for the kind of e-ticketing launch. And then beyond that in the new year, we'll be looking at, at kind of, of where we go next with that and and the, the suite of travel line sites as well. Um, and I mentioned on the last call that we've been working with uh, one of our suppliers on a fares and map cutting tool. Uh, so this will allow local scheme coordinators. We've got 280 plus plus schemes, give or take, up and down the country. Uh, at the minute, it's a very manually, manual process to update fares at every fare setting round until redraw zones. So we've developed a tool that will allow local scheme coordinators to go and input their own fares into the system. Uh, it will also allow them to create their own zones with a map cutting tool, which will then download NAPTAM 
Uh, so we can make all that data available then uh, via the rail data marketplace. Um, so again, that that's all. We're in the final stage of development and we should have that you know, released shortly. So major efficiencies on our side in terms of how we process and manage data, but also the data that we can make available um, as well. And we're hoping it's a stepping stone as well that we'll be able to use this to define multi-operator ticketing zones and draw DRT zones as well. So there's this kind of scope for kind of further development on, on what we've what we've already got. And let's say that'll all, all emerge in the kind of coming weeks. Uh, and months and we're, we're, you know, as part of that, we're going to look to work with the local authority area, possibly on multi-operator multi affairs, just to see if, you know, what we can, what we may need to do with our tool to present those um, in the journey planner as well, ultimately. So, whistle stop to our travel line, but that's what we've been up to. So, I'll pass back to you, Tim, if any questions. Mm. Any questions for Mike? I've got one on the plus bus data. Once that's available will those zones and tickets be available through bods as well as the rail data marketplace or there's no reason well, i suppose there's no, they, they, we'll have the data there tim so yeah that, there's no reason um we hadn't let's say considered really bods or whether it goes plus plus falls outside of the scope of bods as far as understood mm -hmm. um but there's no reason we, we will have the data so there's no reason why you know we couldn't so we'll we'll be exporting a polygon file for all the zones um that, that'll be on there all the fares as well uh will be on there so there's, there's there's no reason why we shouldn't consider that we can take that one away tim yeah mm -hmm. i was just i was just talking to a journey planner supplier the other day and they they were asking the the, the question so uh, yeah yeah i think they might consume it from the rail data marketplace anyway because they've got rail data rail ticketing yeah. prices anyway but yeah i was trying to eulogize about bonds fares to them yeah yeah <laughs> and they raised yeah. it so yeah <laughs> No, I mean, let's see, it'd be available on there, Tim. And, and, and you know, a lot of the plus plus zones replicate the multi multi operator zones in in a, in a large number of cases as well. So the you know the actual zone data will be there. And and and, and again, let's say we this is something we can look to potentially extend to, to DRT as well. That for kind of mapping zones as well. So so yeah, it's, there'll be a lot happening over the next over the coming months. So once we kind of get it in, get it working for plus plus, we can start exploring. Yeah, what else we can we may be able to do with it. Excellent. Any other questions about Traveline? Ben? Just an offer of support. Um, interesting that you're looking at measuring the quality of the data on BOD. So let me know if you've got any questions with that or if I can help with that. Um, yeah, there's lots of different ways to to kind of, you know, slice it. So uh, um, yeah, yeah, I'll be uh, um, very pleased to support in any way I can. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. Thank you. OK, in which case, thank you, Mike. Sim. Uh, that then moves us on to uh, EU standards development. Um, as with lots of things, um, European as well as um, formal standards, things move fairly slowly, um, so there isn't much to update compared to last time um but the uh the 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 couple of big things that i would pull out is the uh the historical reporting data format standard the project to uh, develop that technically uh, is about to start the procurement for the team to do that work um is now in place and uh the first meeting for that is in a couple of weeks um we had a uh a workshop in august um with at least a couple of you um looking at some of the uh uk use cases um that we'll use to to validate that work um so uh a year 18 months time we'll be able to uh to start to uh perhaps use something um at least in a fairly final draft form um even if it hasn't been 
formalized at that point so we can start to see whether it really works version one of these things is never much good anyway um it always uh <laughs> you know it always takes somebody to really implement it to find out actually where you've gone wrong and what you really need to do um to make it work um so um i mean that there, there are a couple of projects lined up already to uh to to do that early um pain um so um yeah so that will be starting soon um the on vehicle standardization stuff um rumbles on it's it potentially going to have quite a big um deal particularly for electric vehicles and um some of the um uh aut automated um vehicle work that's that's going on um but that's going to take a little while to work through um and a bit of a uh a heads up um if you want documentation um on things like Siri and NetEx. If you want the formal documentation in the UK, you have to knock on BSI's door, um, hand over large chunks of cash to get copies of the documents. Um, we've been very fortunate for many years to be able to um, have the, the what are called the digital artifacts in standardization, the XSDs, the schemas, um those sort of things uh readily available you can go on to github and download them previously you could you know go on to a website and download them um send the european standards body that bsi works under um is getting um very twitchy about those digital artifacts and how widely they're used and used for free in particular. Um, and so they're in the process of developing um, a way of storing those and managing them, um, partly because each individual standard um, has a different way of developing and managing the change control process for these digital files. Um, so you know, within public transport, we have a way of doing it that's been thrashed out uh, over many years and NetEx and Siri and, and, and all of those in the Transmodel family are managed in the same way. But the road people that do the road standards um, that have similar things um, do it in quite a different way um, and um, so being standards bodies they go this ought to be done in a standardized approach um, <laughs> and so um, that's also part of the the reason for them wanting to get more control um, long term that does mean that people might need to pay for access to some of this um, which would be really quite a shame if that occurred. Um, it's quite political at the moment um, with a really big P um, in the, um, this is at European Commission level, um, at Ursula von der Leyen level even, um, who is very worried about this because the European Parliament goes, you will do this, under a regulation or a directive and you will do this in a standardized way and include some of these standards um, and they're quite worried about what this might mean for the implementation of some of the uh, European um, regulations and directives um, so um, I think it's got a bit of a way to go um, but it's one to watch um, and be aware of in the UK, we are quite on the sidelines of it. Um, uh, any questions about European stuff? No, okay. 
Um, in which case, um, we have a couple of Ooh, issues to issues. consider. Mm. Yes. Um, so the issues log is the formal way of managing change control process for um, the uh, standards that we use. There are two issues. Um, so um, first one, uh, issue 101, um, is related to enhanced partnership registration numbers. Um, so it was uh, raised um, earlier when we were talking about routes and timetable stuff. So as part of um, Bus Service Act 2017, authorities can go, we want to take control of the registration process. Um, and some authorities have done that. Um, a way of trying to manage the fact that there are now multiple registration management organisations um, has been uh, defined uh, based on ATCO codes. Um, there is an issue with um, trans exchange um, in the textually. Um, it said that a registration number is four characters um, for uh, Enhanced partnership registrations, that's not true. Um, so uh, it can be um, eight characters. And so uh, we're changing the uh, textual description in the trans exchange schema. Um, shouldn't affect anybody unless you have coded up rules based on um, the, the documentation rather than just the pure schema. It's unbounded in the schema, um, but uh, textually it it had the limit on it, which at least one supplier had paid heed to. So, um, any questions, comments, concerns about this change? No. You said it can be eight characters, Tim. That makes it sound like it's either four or eight. Is it that the this is curiosity now. It might be going down a rabbit hole. Is that that people can choose however they want to, sorry, the authorities that are taking it on can choose however they want to register it, or is there some other reference somewhere that says? No, so OTC or DVSA actually um, will continue to be four characters. If people are following the advice that's come out through BODS, they will be eight. But actually, there is no way of mandating an authority to follow that. So they could do something else. But Which it's still is why it's not characters. either four or eight. <laughs> it's uh, it's up, up to eight, eight, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, nerd question. Not really of any relevance. I was just curious. No, no, no. Th these things in Word are important. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And then um, issue 102. So as part of the flexible bus services work, um, it was uh, identified that there's quite a lot of services where the bus goes off into a little village or down a road, but only when somebody on the bus has requested it to do that or, you know, it carries off on, you know, extends a journey. Um, and rather than requiring the full implementation of a flexible data structure uh, in those cases, um, uh, we've decided that actually it would be better just to make a bit of a tweak to the activity at stops. Um, this is also in line with other standards like GTFS and uh, Transmodel has some uh, uh, NetEx, uh, sorry, it has some uh, wider options. So we've added three uh, stop activities um, in there and uh, do an update. This is quite important for a surprising number of uh, bus routes do this. Um, 
so um, I don't know whether anybody's got any questions, comments, thoughts on it. Rob. Just a very quick thought. Um, if this second one, 102, is a schema change, is that a new revision of Trans Exchange 2.4? Or since there's already an existing 2.5, is it being ported into both? Do, do we therefore have a fork in, in sort of trans exchange versions? How does it work? Yeah, no, fair question. So um, this triggers a release of 2.4.1 um, and 2.5.1. So the two will match. OK, thank you. OK, any others? No. OK, in which case we'll uh, sort it out. Right, um, next meeting um, is uh, in the diary for Thursday, the 7th of December. Um, the last couple we had moved to a Friday. Um, so try and see whether that helped attendance um it has meant that a few people that couldn't join on a thursday can join but overall the feedback is fridays are more problematical um than a thursday afternoon so i suggest we go back to a thursday afternoon OK, in which case, uh, 7th of December, um, is there any other business? Well, no. not today. <laughs> OK, in which case, um, next time, um, the Rail Delta Marketplace are hopeful to uh, be mm. able to attend and give us an update on their work um they popped by about a year ago uh, and said we're, they're going to be launching stuff um they've been running for a little while so it'll be interesting to see what they uh, are doing yeah um and if there is no any other and business <laughs> okay in which case uh, thank you everybody for your time this afternoon and have a good weekend Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.